there are several ornamental insect pests that we need to be looking out for at this time of year. With us today is Ken Pinkston from the OSU Entomology Department. Welcome to, welcome Thank to you, the show, Ken. Uh, Good to be here. We've got a pyracantha hedge. You may not recognize it in early summer, but this is the plant that gives those beautiful clusters of orange berries in the fall. But we do have some insect pests on to watch out for in the summer. We're what starting to, to have some pests here that anyone growing pyracantha should be on the lookout for, Jim. What'd you find? Well, we, in this case, I've found a little spot here starting to show up damage from uh, a, a lace bug that gets on here and sucks the juices out of the leaves. And when it does so, it leaves a kind of a chlorotic look and a speckled leaf surface. Uh, a person might first observe just a, an isolated spot of discoloration to their pyracantha. And if on closer inspection, they'll turn the leaves over, I think they'll start to find either the lace bug itself, which is basically black in color with kind of a lacy patterned wing, or little black shiny spots that are the fecal material or the droppings of the, the black lace spots. bug. And that's a very good indication to them that the, the uh, lace bug is working their pyracanth over pretty good and this, this spot will gradually spread and over time if not controlled will really disfigure the pyracanth. Now looking at those adults I guess they get the name lace bug because the wings are kind of lacy. Lacy pattern, yes sir. Mm -hmm. Sure do, yeah. Now they, they're sucking the plant juices and well, where, where, where do these where did they come from? I mean, we've got some adults and some The adults right now are getting going good, and on a few of these leaves, I'm finding some immature, some babies. So they're just now starting the reproductive process of going full tilt. But basically, they've overwintered as adults, and some of those have obviously knocked the population down a little bit in terms of making it through the winter and all. But those that did survive are now having mated and are in the process of having laid the eggs and the immatures or the baby forms are just now hatching out and starting to to feed for the summer, and uh, we'll get a good crop of them going here within the next few weeks. Okay. How many generations can you get? Well, with this insect, uh, the unfortunate part is uh, most of us as homeowners that do have pyracantha in our landscape will not get by with just one treatment. It's very rare that you can do that. Uh, if you catch them about at this stage, say towards the latter part of June, uh, you could uh, uh, control this very nicely and uh, rock along till the end of July, 1st August, thinking you would have no further problems, and another generation could circle around on you so that you could be confronted with the same problem then later in the summer. So even if you spray, is, th is those, are those other insects ones that you missed with the spray, or can they come in from other they, plants? They can fly in from uh, neighbors not treating their pyracantha, or, or they are also winged horns, and they can fly considerable distances. So theoretically, by the end of summer, we can circle through uh, two to three complete life cycles of these things that could hit pyracantha and really cause some some major damage by the end of summer. Are pyracantha the only plants that have lace bug problems? Well, hawthorn and pyracantha with this particular species of lace bug. But otherwise, there are lace bugs on other plants. Uh, if someone sees a sycamore that has uh, a very similar damage pattern to what we're observing here on the pyracantha, and the black shiny spots on the underside of the leaf, that's a sycamore lace bug. It does not get on anything else besides sycamore, so very host specific. Uh, elms also get them, and they're very specific to elms. And also azaleas, for those folks in the eastern part of the state, they're susceptible to a lace bug that doesn't get on other plant materials. So if you don't have problems on your pyracantha, but do on your azalea, right. you don't, don't need turn to us worry. Off. Don't turn us off today, because you could be having this problem on another plant. Okay. Now. Lace bugs are one problem. Notice another yes. something down here. I'm uh, not sure. As a matter of fact, right on down the way here on this same particular hedge plane, we have another little problem that unfortunately a lot of people could be having problems with this time of year. Not necessarily on pyracantha, but I happen to have found it really starting here, and that's with uh, the old nemesis, the bagworm. I can see it crawling around a little bit. Little, little, little tiny. tiny Baby bagworms that have just formed their protective coverings are just starting to row. You can see the damage where they, unlike the, uh, the lace bug we just looked at, here the damage results in complete skeletonization or stripping of the foliage, I mean, pardon me, the uh, cuticular outer layers of the leaves off and leaving them brown. So it's not and sucking the juices, it's actually eating part of the leaf. It's actually consuming the leaves. In some cases, the leaves are actually gone. In other cases, where they were small, they've 
just stripped the outer layer of the leaf surface off, and in some cases, gone ahead and chewed holes completely through the leaves. Now these, and uh, they're they're quite numerous in here. They're just starting up. Yeah, there's these, some of your old ones from last year. Yeah. The bags that by the end of the summer they will reach that size. So you can see what we're up against in relation to uh, uh, the amount of food consumption of a bagworm that would be in a protective covering like this bag at this stage late in the summer versus how they're just getting started right now. When do you need to control the bagworms? Ideally, Jim, it would be right now. And obviously we're looking here at pyracantha and not everyone in the state of Oklahoma is going to uh, encounter a bagworm problem necessarily on their pyracantha, but it would be worth watching out for. But from the standpoint, you can see how ugly it can turn a plant in a very short period of time. But they're very susceptible to insecticides at this stage. When they're small. When you find a bagworm, much like these you found from last year, these are obviously not live, but uh, when they reach this size late in the summer, they're very difficult to kill with anything other than maybe a sledgehammer or drive a stake through their hearts. Now these young ones now, where, how do they overwinter? Okay. Were they adults? The overwintering the stage with the bagworm, uh, I guess the good news is uh, we have the shot at control one time should, if we time it correctly, should provide us season-long control of the plant material that, that they're feeding on. Because the overwintering process will start in late August, early September with the females will remain in some of the bags that reach this size that are left on the plant and lay eggs right in those cases. Those cases then containing the overwintering eggs will set there till next spring. Thus by, oh, this year they ran a little late in uh, 88, but in most years they will hatch out uh, usually by the first week of June. They're hatched out and reaching this size. We're probably running in most parts of the state a couple of weeks late this year. So there's only one generation. But so if you control these little ones, when they're about that this should size, if you let them get about that size, you should have control on that plant material the rest of the summer. Now there will be that uh, diehard out there that that indicates to you that uh, they treated when they were that size, and two weeks later they found a few more bagworms. Well, I, I just would point out. That not all of them will hatch on the same appointed day and hour, unfortunately, even though they've overwintered in the same manner. So uh, as with all biological things, there can be some, some change or differences. Some variation. So uh, there will be a few get by our spray for whatever reason. Uh, maybe we didn't adequately cover it. Uh, the, uh, the situation with the uh, timing then becomes try to catch the majority of them when they're about this size that we're seeing here, and you'll have a pretty good healthy plant material. Uh, in terms of controls or chemicals too here, we might just speak basically since we're on pyracantha, uh, the bagworm itself in that stage, Jim, is fairly easily controlled with uh, orthene, with uh, seven, with nullifion, a number of products readily available to homeowners. Uh, the uh, same holds true with our uh, lace bug. It's rel relatively easy insect control with any of those products we just named, but you need very thorough coverage that really causes this plant material to virtually drip when we're through spraying it. They get, and as you, you saw, cover the all bug, of the leaves on all of the sides. Yeah, the lace bugs being on the underside, you need very thorough coverage there. Now the lace bugs, you said we've got an individual lace bug for each different plant. Is that the, is that the same way for the bagworms? No, unfortunately, that bagworm's uh, much like I am. It'll eat about anything. <laughs> It'll just about eat anything. So anyone with from a ball cypress to an elm to uh, obviously uh, junipers and uh, uh, the various evergreen plants, the uh, arborvita, uh, even our eastern red cedar, are all susceptible to the old bagworm. And it is the same species. It just happens to have an appetite for wherever those uh, mama bagworms decided to lay. The, or they'll the, eat anything the, they have, happen to be sitting on. Yes, sir. They'll, and they'll do a good job of it. If you leave them alone by August, uh, obviously you can have some very large dead areas or stripped out areas in a plant. Another problem a lot of people have vegetables and ornamentals are, are spider mites. Do you have any that you can show us? Yes. Why don't we move down here? I think I have some roses that might be a real good example of okay. some spider mites. Now these roses, these are ones you had in the greenhouse? Yes, we were doing some chemical tests on them. Started out to be a test for some aphid materials, the new ones we were testing, and uh, obviously they didn't do a real good job on spider mites because we started to develop some spider mites on a few of the plants, and we found some early on symptoms, uh, Jim, that the homeowner would have similar circumstance with, with a lot of their, uh, not only flowering materials, but with uh, some of the 
evergreens that they'd have around the home and, and some of the trees, deciduous trees, but we started to see some discoloration. And this is very similar to what maybe an individual that has pyracantha would see, as we saw earlier with the uh, lace bug damage. It's just a discoloration to the top part of the leaf or a stippling, you know, light fading yellow uh, on part of the leaf. And are mites of sucking? Yes, sucking pests they are like not this? true insects. They are, they are uh, closer relative to ticks and uh, that group of uh, arthropods, but they do suck plant juices just like uh, the, the lace bugs do. And consequently, when you lose chlorophyll or uh, plant juices like that, this is why we start to get this discoloration. And they are uh, a pest that tends to congregate on the bottom sides of the leaves. Okay. Uh, consequently, they're not always noticeable to the homeowner, and in this case, it's a real tiny creature. I mean, to the naked eye, they're hard to resolve. Now, some of this, this sticky, shiny stuff, this that's residual from the aphids. That's yes. not the spider yeah. mites now, at this all. this is not caused. This, this plant material that has the almost, uh, looks like it's been varnished uh, to the people at home, uh, that's a result of the high carbohydrate uh, exudate of the aphid as they've been feeding and passing that through their system. It's coating the leaves that are below the aphids. Uh, this would be similar, by the way, to what people would see if they have elm trees out in the front yard. Uh, the sticky stuff on their cars and on their windshield is the honeydew, this is called, from the aphid feeding, and it's not produced by the mite. Okay, well, this this is a light damage on mite. What happens when it gets a little bit heavy? When it gets extremely heavy, then you have plant materials like here on my left. We we'll get over to... Let me move over a little bit to show the folks what we run into. We, we progress gradually from that light damage over to something uh, a little more similar to, to these where the, speckling, the speckling's a little heavier. Mm -hmm. uh, we start to see a little matting or congregation of this webbing. It's webbing. like spider webs on there. Very, that's where the name spider might derive from because when you get large numbers of them, they do produce copious webbing. Uh, an individual starting to suspect that they have spider mites on some plant material around the house and do not, you know, they're not able to resolve the thing with looking at the bottom side of the leaf or they're not obviously having uh, uh, webbing produced, can use a, a white sheet of paper to place under the foliage. I'll demonstrate that very quickly, but they can just place the white sheet of paper under whatever plant material and vigorously tap that, that foliage over it and observe for tiny moving little spots on their sheet of paper. I, I can't see anything from oh, over here. It would be very difficult for to show on TV, but this is for the homeowner, you know, out in near garden, that's the easiest way to see if you but check for spider mites or after you've made a control effort uh, to look and see if your control's doing any good for you. Now this, this is still mite damage here? Yes, this is where we've taken the uh, flowering part here. It was just, and we've removed some of the webbing here, but the webbing has just Cause the plant not to, or the flower not to go ahead and open up, and then the mites are feeding in in the petal area, in this case on this rose. But you can see other areas of real heavy webbing here, and in and these, this webbing, these tiny spots, those are the, the those tiny, are the mites. Those are the mites. They're okay. actually caught up in their own webbing, there that are moving out of feeding on the, the bottom sides of the rose leaves in this case, and and then up in the webbing area. Now, are are the mites are they very species specific like lace bugs? Is there a rose mite and an arborvitae no, mite? Jim, in this case, the, the two spotted spider mites that most of our folks in Oklahoma are very familiar with that grow ornamental plants or that have gardens, uh, all the same species and they have a wide variety of food materials that they'll move back and forth from. Uh, marigolds, tomatoes, uh, uh, virtually all tree species are susceptible, junipers, uh, cedars, uh, obviously roses. Okay. Uh, the number of flowering bedding plants are all susceptible. It seems like most of the damage comes up in the summer. Yes, and uh, another part of that, Jim, is that they're, they do better the hotter and drier it gets. Uh, as a matter of fact, probably our worst mite problems are ahead of us. Uh, as you get into mid-July, hot and dry, uh, the populations of spider mites can virtually double in a week if, if you leave them alone. So there can be large numbers of mites uh, on plant materials in just a very short period of time. You get into August, with not a great deal of rainfall, they'll even get worse. Uh, another factor that comes to play is uh, when people treat for spider mites frequently, they will not use a heavy enough volume of total solution or chemical when they treat it to thoroughly coat the plant material and especially the undersides of the leaves so that the plant is virtually just raining uh, when they've treated it. And so with a population that can double in a week, you'd 
you really have to get you, almost all of them in order to have You control. have to make a very thorough attempt at your control effort. And the second part, Jim, is as we were demonstrating with the sheet of paper, a person should go out at about a three to five day interval after they've treated and checked that plant material again for live mites beating the, the foliage over that sheet of paper to see if they see the little specks moving about. If they're moving about, that plant should be treated again at five to seven days. Now, do these insecticides or the spray materials, do they kill the adults and the eggs? No, they're, they're primarily at the uh, adult stage is what you're, you're controlling in this case with the materials that are on the market today. Uh, the uh, product Kelthane, uh, Diazinon, Melathion are probably three of the very common ones. Uh, another product called Metacystox R is also uh, readily available in, in uh, trade stores and nurseries. So it's probably very important to get a second application on there because first one gets the adults but you still got some eggs there that are going to come the out The bottom line is you sell them from spray one time for spider mites. You at least have to have two applications and more commonly three. Uh, and the three, when you have the three applications, you're looking at about one day, five day, and then up waiting another seven days after that second application or third application. When you have mites as heavy as we have them right here, for example, Jim, in the greenhouse, I'd have to treat this probably three times to really clean this mess up. So the key is to watch them carefully and get on a regular spray schedule and watch them and make certain you yes. don't. So that you don't have you plants don't that look like Ken Pinkston's roses. <laughs> Well, this is one of the elms we're looking for, Jim, but it's not finding the bugs, I promised. This is the elm leaf beetle you're We were looking searching for? elm leaf beetle on this particular this elm. The Siberian elms in Oklahoma are notorious for having that problem, but we found one that's rather disgustingly healthy. But yeah. I think we have some examples to show the folks of what the uh, damage as well as the larvae and the adult looks like. What does the adult look like? The adult beetles, which are mostly active in May and early June, are uh, yellowish to olive color with some little stripes on them, about a quarter of an inch long. Lay their eggs on the bottom sides of the leaves in clusters, and they'll be kind of a lemon color and lemon shape. Uh, those hatch out then into the larval stages that are uh, about like any caterpillar to, to most folks. They're not like those that turn into butterflies and moths, but a little slug-like organism that's kind of yellow and black, about a quarter of an inch in its full size. And the damage differential is that the adults, when you first see on an elm tree will eat holes in the leaves all the way through a leaf. And as the larvae get going, uh, they skeletonize the leaves, turning them brown. And that's what causes the most uh, severe damage. And uh, we have three to four generations of these things over this period of the summer. So uh, if anyone uh, lets a tree go from, say, uh, mid-June to first part of, of October, it will really be a sickly brown color if they have not taken control action for the elm leaf beetle. So it would be important to get that first generation. Very important. Uh, if you control the first generation, you will get the majority of the damage causing uh, part of that elm leaf beetle. Uh, the, the other uh, generations can obviously cause some damage to the tree, but they're not as severe as that first generation. Now, most of what we've talked about so far have been small plants. <laughs> A tree this size Realistically, the homeowner be extremely difficult for a homeowner we, with a hose-in sprayer or a trombone sprayer to, to spray a tree to a tree of this size. So, uh, in this case, I would definitely recommend a pest control company to come out and uh, treat a tree like this. But they should realize that that one treatment may not satisfy the whole summer. Uh, you may control that generation right then, but 30 days or so later, you could have elm leaf beetle again. So even though we can't find it yet, it's coming. We can keep watching. In parts it. of Oklahoma, we're already having it. Uh, in this case of the trees that we've chosen today, we didn't find them as heavy. They're just getting started. So I would be out looking for it if I you know, value my own tree.